Hey, Sean, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, Corey, thanks for having me. It's a, it's a real honor. It's actually kind of come full circle here that uh, I've listened to you forever, and now that I'm on your podcast, it's a real honor. So thanks for having me. Yeah, right on. Well, we did some stuff. We did some special stuff to get to get on this one, and it's really <laughs> exciting to talk about it. Uh, you know, for everybody that's listening right now, this is our second uh, uh, video in a three-part series of the good, bad, and the ugly. And I really want to talk about this is the Warner Rob, Robbins portfolio and how I'll call it teamwork makes the dream work because that's really what, how you put deals together. It is not, it's very rarely a single person game. It's more often that you have multiple people that bring different skill sets to the game and you kind of Voltron or if that's for, that's maybe trans, I don't know if it's Voltron anymore, but like for me it's Voltron. Things come together to make the big one, right? <laughs> What is that for you, Sean? Because you're only like 17 or something. I know you're a little <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> Other than that, probably Power Rangers. They all, you know, they all come together. Oh, that's right. There you go. Power Rangers. Yeah. Or Transformers, whatever you want to say. Okay. Either way, right? So, um, but before we get into that, though, let's just kind of give you, I want everybody to kind of hear your story and I, I you know, just to understand where you come from and what you've been doing. Um, and it's a really cool story. So sure you are, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, thanks for having me. Honor to be here. And my background is similar to Corey's in the sense that I started off in a traditional finance arena. So think financial services, worked for one of the, the top, what we call in that industry asset manager, which is different from what real estate considers asset management. It's someone, think of like your fidelities of the world, vanguards who manage money in like stock funds, bond funds. And so that's what I did. Um, went to school for finance, got a job at this this firm, was super excited at the time. I thought I thought this was the way to help people grow wealth for, you know, their future for the retirement. And for a while I thought that was the way to do it. And so you really get down to the nuts and bolts of it and you realize the people who are making money are the fund managers. Those are the guys who are making the money. You know, everyone that's working at that firm and that's what not everyone, but a lot of them that they care about their pocket and not the investor. And to me, it just didn't sit well. It's the you know, Wolf these of Wall are, Street. Yeah, exactly. I hey, was just the, watching it with my kids. Great right? movie. He's sitting there <laughs> banging his chest. He's like, your goal is to get their money into your pocket. It's true. It had that, nothing to do with the investor. It's true. You know, these, these big firms are taking, you know, they're putting their clients in one position and they're taking a bet which is the opposite position. So if their clients are long, they're taking a short position. So they're essentially betting that their clients are going to fail. Their positions are going to fail. And it also gets in the pay to play arena where these firms are paying to be put on financial advisors recommended list. So quote unquote recommended because it's only recommended because these firms are paying like a million bucks to get on there. Um, and it just didn't sit well with me. And, and even beyond that, to grow wealth, it's not the most cost effective, not the most tax efficient way to do so. And I'd always loved real estate. And so then I, I took a, a course uh, at a local university in Boston and took night classes while I was working and, and really learned the real estate finance aspect of it and realized this is the way to grow wealth. Because as Corey, I know, has told many times on this podcast, it's, it's a way to grow wealth and it's the way the most the, the wealthiest people on the planet do it because it's tax efficient you can save you can you know protect your money from uncle sam and historically is way less volatile than the stock market so what i did is then i just researched it thought i was going to go to the corporate world but then i said what am i doing I i'm sick of working for someone else's dream i want to you know work for my own dream and so to do that you know i'd been building you know a portfolio of small multis along the side, but to do it, I had to leave quote unquote wall street because I couldn't be a licensed, um, under FINRA and the sec, and then also raise money on the side for, um, real private real estate deals. So I actually had to leave my job and I don't recommend that to everyone. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, it's, it's not easy cut, cutting off that, that solid income source, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. And now I'm here, you know, raising money, for syndications on, you know, finding deals for syndications and now soon to be operating, you know, big multifamily deals, which I give Corey all the credit for that. He's paved the way for me 
and you know he knows it i'm, I'm very thankful for him so for that's cool. where we're at now yeah yeah so what a great story man um so i'll i'll, I'll embellish a little bit so sean came to me you've been with you've been in my mastermind for what almost a year and a half is it almost two years? no i think it's over two years now two about years. two years in november of 19 yeah yep. Now, and he's been diligently paying. So listen, he's been paying, right? And he's he finally got, I mean, sometimes it takes, it took me two years before when I first started. Yeah. Till I found a deal, till I was ready, right? It's really weird. But um, you got to go through like a little bit of a growth factor and, and it takes a minute to get get it all in. But then you, it's the law of the first deal too. It's the hardest one to get the first deal, right? Um, and once you do get it, then you're like, wait a second, I think I can do it again, right? And it's really about putting Voltron together every time. So on this particular deal, Sean, you went out and hustled. We were talking about like you were raising money, like, hey, I'm I'm working on raising money, and and which I teach raising money first. I always I've always stressed raising money is the most important thing for you to master, but it also is the longest running pad as well. Because it takes a long time to get capital conditioned to give you money. So sometimes the easiest way, and so after the first year, I was like, dude, let's pivot. Go out and just go find a deal, right? Yeah, yeah. Just go find a deal. And so, and that's what you start focusing on. And lo and behold, within like, I feel like six months of that, you came to me and you're like, dude, I think I got a deal. Yeah. And that was that Warner Robins portfolio. So... Talk to me about how you found that deal. Yeah, well, Corey, so listeners, I'm sure you're aware of this. For those that aren't, Corey has a book called Copy Your Way to Success. And I've actually always been, I've been very good at that. If 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 I want to achieve something, I find someone who's very, who's achieved that and is very good at it. And I just model, you know, the way they did that as best as I can and, you know, put my flair on it because I think you got to be original as well. Yep. And so that's what I did. Corey told me this is how he would find a deal. And so that's exactly what I did. And what that entailed was I reached out to Corey's uh, banker, which he is now my banker as well. And I reached out to Aaron's his name, reached out to Aaron and asked for a list of brokers, um, commercial real estate brokers in my target markets that were actually doing business, not just a list of brokers, but ones that actually transacted in the last 12 months. And I took that list and then I, you know, filtered it from the top performer down and then based on off a unit count compared to sales volume you can kind of tell what class they're in obviously less units and higher volume that's definitely a class and then you know more volume um less acquisition price usually a b or c so that's i kind of went after i went after the b and c and targeted those brokers and what i would do is i would send an email introducing myself and then as Corey teaches, I leveraged using a track record, what he calls a credibility kit. So since I was looking to partner with Corey on these deals I was going to find, I used his credibility kit with my branding per, you know, Corey, Corey allowed this to happen, obviously. And, and I, so I would send the credibility kit with that track record and then what I was looking for. So B, C class, value add, and then, you know, more details. But that would be the introduction. And then I would pick up the phone and call them right after I sent the email. And if they would pick up, you know, I'd have a conversation with them to obviously tell them what I'm looking for, but spend most of the, that call talking about them, not really about business, you know, what, what they like. And then I would say, Hey, are you going to be in so-and-so market next week? I'm flying down. And they'd be like, yeah, okay, let's grab a coffee. And so I would, I got on a plane and I would fly down and, it's it's crazy what happens when you actually fly down and meet them in person, especially when you fly down and meet them without a prospect of looking at a deal. I had one broker ask me, so what brings you to the market? And I was like, what do you mean? I, I flew down here to see you. And he's like, really? Wow, that that's impressive. And so then I, I'd start building a rapport with these guys and then I would go back home and I would handwrite them a thank you letter for meeting with me, send it to them, and then I would follow up. And that, that meant a lot to them because the they're used to people just blasting them with emails and, the and maybe fo maybe phone calls if if they're lucky. Hey, put what deals you got? Hey, hook me up. You got any off market deals? It's like, come on, man. You really think they're going to send you an off market deal the first time you're talking to them? 
it doesn't work like that. They, they first they need to know who you are. They need to trust you, and then they need to like you too. Um, and so that that's the way I kind of did things. And then I would follow up, usually monthly, some sometimes more if I, if I was feeling a good vibe on the relationship. So for this one, we had I'd fostered a relationship actually in the Charlotte market, and the way this team works is they share their commission. So mm-hmm. it's not necessarily eat what you kill. It's everyone eats the proverbial like big kill. So they referenced me to this broker in the Atlanta market because they had a deal they thought I would like since they all get paid on everything. They, they're they proactive in sharing. And so then I flew down to meet this guy, met this guy, his broker, and brought our property management company with me to actually look at the deal. And afterwards he was like, Wow, like I've never had anyone do this this thorough of a like a on a preliminary tour. And he was just really impressed. And and so then he he I knew he was gonna take our offer serious if we could get the number they were looking for. And so then we we sent them an offer. And what was really cool about it to go off this whole thing about relationships is they realized one of the deals in the credibility kit was a deal they sold. And it was a student housing deal that Corey had bought a, a few years ago. And so they, they, they knew we were the real deal. They're like, oh, these guys can close. So I knew that put us even higher up on the list of you know, taking us really seriously. So that's just a hit home. It's all about relationships and leverage whenever you can. And I'm lucky enough to be able to leverage Corey's. Luckily, you saw Corey. the credibility kit, right? Yes, <laughs> exa- exactly. Yeah, hey. Bad for Corey for not following up. (laughs) (laughs) But that was, I think, the piece that really put us in the door, don't you think? Yeah. Just, I mean, you were already going to be in the best and final, right? Yeah. And you didn't, now, here's the beauty of this. I I am actually clueless to everything until you say, Corey, I need you to get on a best and final call. (laughs) Right? And I was like, wait, so what are Hold on, give me the metrics again, right? I'm going to pull up my... Because I've been really letting you handle it, right? Right, right. You're kind of just driving the bus, driving the bus, driving the bus to get to that point. And then it was the time for me to show up a little bit. and um, and But that was a great call, right? He went over some stuff, and then he realized immediately that, that we knew each other, and he's like, oh, yeah. And what you... I'm not sure, I can't remember if it came up in the conversation, it was that University Crossing deals was hairy, it was really yeah. weird, and we still closed. Like I still made sure I closed that deal, but dude, it was not easy, and I made that happen. But normally, that kind of deal would probably have fell apart. But I made it happen, and uh, and that meant a lot to the broker. Yeah. And so I just looked at. I think he looked at that, saying, you know, because when things go south, they want to know that you're not just going to, you know, cut bait. And so I think that helped us in that deal, right? I yeah, know it did. definitely. So, um, so then he calls, what does it feel like when you got that offer accepted? Oh, it's amazing. It was funny. We we're actually at well, a mastermind meeting when it got accepted. Oh, that's right. You, yeah. You, you called me up actually to, cause we do these things in Corey's mastermind where we do hot seats, where we present, you know, what we've done the last quarter, kind of like an accountability and also, you know, like a given and ask type thing. And so Corey called me up to do my presentation, my hot seat presentation. And right as I was walking up, my phone went off and luck. I wasn't even going to bring my phone. I just saw it sitting on the table and it lit up. And it was one of those weird things. I'd been thinking that about that all day, like, Oh, it's going to happen today. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it was probably the mo- one of the most amazing feelings. So then I, I went yeah, outside. You're like, hold on. Call. I got to take this call. Right. And we're like, <laughs> Oh, it's the, it's the deal. I'm like, he's going to get the deal. <laughs> and he, and you walk back in, everybody's like looking at you. Did you get it? And you're like, Got it. Yeah, I raised my hands like the Rocky, you know. <laughs> it was awesome, man. Yeah, it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling. So it's like, man, won the deal. Um, now I still, like, so I don't think I've, at that point, had I been to the property? No, you hadn't been to the property yet. It was just myself um, and our property management Construction company. management company, yep. Yeah. Then we, we arranged another trip. To go out there and, oh, no, no, no. We put it under contract. Yeah, we did. And then we just did due diligence. Right, yeah, because that that was, and I, this is probably important to let the listeners know, is really listen and ask and listen for what the seller wants because we were pretty much in the ballpark on the acquisition price, but they really wanted hard earnest money. 
like higher than we were at. And it, essentially it was like, if you put it there, you guys get this deal. So mm-hmm. always listen to what they they really want. Sometimes you, it's yeah, price, sometimes really saying, it's right? terms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was like 200K, right? Yeah, 200 and then 100 after um, due if diligence. If you want to extend, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what we did is you wrote you wrote up a great contract, which was what I teach is my standard forty five day or thirty business days uh, contract uh, with or and then uh, th- that's the uh, due diligence period. Then another thirty days for um, to close, and then we also gave ourselves a thirty day extension, mm-hmm. which by the way we ended up using, right. Yeah. And now the 30 day extension, I think cost us a, an extra hundred thousand dollars of earnest money to get it, to get that extra 30 days. So we were actually under contract for like 120 days. Yeah. It was a long one. It was a long closing. It felt like forever. <laughs> it did. And, and the reason because of that, which we're going to talk about in next episode of raising capital and how we put it together, it was just a slow process for us to get into this one group, which we knew would go and fund the deal. And we just needed to make it, we got late to that party. And so our whole timeline kind of changed, but ultimately this group funded the whole deal. And um, so um, Sean didn't have to worry as much now. And it's cool because he called Uncle Corey, right? So Uncle Corey showed up and I stroked the 200 check, but I really didn't stroke the $200,000 check. Again, this is all about like, what did you say? Not Transformers. What was the other one? Oh, either. Yeah. Uh, Power Rangers. You it's know? Power Rangers. So we Power Rangered it up. I called yeah. my friend Mike Cambright, right? And and Mike's like, I was like, hey, Mike, listen, I got this deal. Because at that point in time, I think I've got like four deals kind of under contract. And you start putting 300, 300, 300, you got a million dollars out in money. So you're like, dude, <laughs> can someone else do this for me, please? So I called Mike and said, hey, Mike, I'll make you a deal. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of GP, and you come in with the earnest money. He's like, no problem, right? So he sends the earnest money um, because he knows and trusts what we're, do- what we're doing. So he funds the earnest money. You find the deal. And then I've got this other uh, gentleman, Mark Delator, that I know has the right source of capital for this deal. And he had been talking to say, Corey, I really want to do a deal with you. Let me know when you have one that's kind of in this range. And so this one fit that bill exactly. And so um, so that's kind of what we did next. But um, we went on the due diligence. So that was really my first time truly on site. I'd seen all the financials up until that point. And because you're using my construction manager, I called them and got the download. He's like, no, no, this is a really good deal, right? Mm-hmm. But it was still $2.2 million rehab, which is like a lot of money, right? That's a lot of it's yeah. a lot of money to for like rehab. And so I was a little nervous, but I remember getting to that property. And I was like, oh, well, this is a deal, right? I mean, it, to me, it very clearly said a deal. Now, the only thing I didn't like, which I still don't like, is the Briardale, right? Yeah. The redheaded stepchild property, which needs the most love, right? Um, but I was telling on the first episode I just did, Sean, I was talking about how um, we raised the salaries because what they currently have, we, we actually raised it almost $80,000 um, in salaries because we wanted to add another really full-time maintenance guy that's going to be dedicated to that Briardale property, right? And it's part of our recipe for success on, on that uh, project. So, Sean, let me ask you this. Uh, in going through um, just what was your biggest lessons or takeaways from doing and getting one under contract? Um, obviously partnerships are number one because you're not, you're not going to take one down by yourself. Even if you have all the money in the world, you, you, you need that experience unless you're just going to stroke a check without debt. But uh, I would say partnerships and also just to just being persistent. There's so many people looking at reaching out to these brokers um, and there's so many people that already have pre-existing relationships, but you just got to set yourself apart. Um, and that involves flying down and meeting these brokers in person and, ha- and don't just talk business, have them talk about themselves. You know, everyone loves to talk about themselves, especially brokers. They're usually that type A personality that love to talk about themselves, which is nothing wrong with that. So just get them talking and then they feel comfortable with you. 
and then try to find a connection. Like I know Corey stresses this, you know, he loves motorcycles, Harley. So he, he finds, you know, brokers that love that and he connects with them. You know, I like golf and skiing. Um, so I connect with that and this guy, I'm going to go play golf with him later this month. I'm going to fly down there. We're going to play a day, day of golf. He already told me he has some deals coming up that he's going to show me. So that's what it's about. It's about building relationships and continue to foster them Yeah. because they'll just keep feeding you. And then when you go to sell that deal, you you better bring that deal back to the bro- broker that Without sold it to you. Without a doubt, right? Because yeah. they'll do well for you, right? They know it, they understand it, and they'll see the value, right? So I, I, I think that's totally ag- agreed. Now, now so, so we closed, right? So we closed on the property. Now we're just now starting to get into operations and you're getting to be a part of that piece. And we've just kind of started with the, the operation segment, but uh, what's your goals and what are you hoping to get out of that whole process there? Yeah, so the great thing about this business is you can be a lot of different things. You can just be a capital raiser. You can just be a deal finder. You can be an operator. You can be all of them. And I'm really excited to to learn operations. That kind of, like, I, don't get me wrong. I'm going to continue to look for deals and find deals because that's my background was building relationships with people, entertaining them. That's what I did in finance, you know, and building that type of relationship. So I'm definitely going to do that. But I'm super excited about learning operations. And, and personally from, you know, knowing Corey for over two years now and, you know, listening to his podcast, reading his books and all that. I know Corey is one of the best operators out there. So I'm really excited to learn operations. And that's where I want my future to go. I want to, you know, operate as well as, as find deals and bring in capital. Yeah. And really, it's, it's just the next piece of it, right? So finding deals is more math, right? Um, construction management is a little bit more uh, understanding just that, you know, how much does things cost to repair truly? And how much is it really going to take, right? So we third party that out currently um, to uh, our, our construction management company, and then um, and then operations is really uh, really holding your um, your property management company's hand and letting them give you enough feedback, but you still got to like hold the line. They're always coming back to you for you know approvals, yes, no, uh, maybe, right? Or what do we think about that? And a lot of times you've. What I've learned in the operations side is you've got to ask lots of questions, right? right? What is this going to happen? How are we going to do this? What are we going to do this? Tell us, what do you think about that? And then let everybody give you uh, the feedback. And eventually you just, then you make your, what do you think is the best choice, right? Of, of how to move forward. I think that's, and, and you're going to see that as we start right now, we're doing weekly calls. Why? Because we just took over the property, right? Mm-hmm. Now, is it going to change drastically from week to week? No, but we just want to keep our fingers on the pulse because we just bought the property. We need to make sure, you know, like we're talking about the people. Is there any problems with anything else? Our last call was real quick, right? We were like lasted right. all of like seven minutes. Yeah. Um, but it's because we, you know, nothing was really moving at that point in time. Uh, so sometimes they can get a lot longer. Sometimes they're just short. Here's what I got to report. Nothing's really changed. We're, we're looking fine. We're pretty much filled up. We're like 95%. Um, and they were just talking about like make sure we have the vacants ready to start turning, and they were actually we said no let's just let's not turn those let's go fill them up because we still need to do the exterior stuff exterior work so we can lead we got to bring them in because we want to be able to get the most rent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If yeah. we don't if we don't uh, if we do all the just the interior stuff and not fix the exterior stuff, we may be losing out because we got to get the shock and all. Yeah. Right. So and that's something you would coming in. No. Yeah, and that's something you wouldn't know unless you had the experience. So that's what I'm really excited about. And it makes perfect sense. People judge a book by its cover. So they're not going to come to your property if it looks, doesn't matter how good it looks on the inside, if it looks like junk on the outside, yep. they're not going to be. Get drawn you know. in. And then also, yeah. it also puts kind of all your uh, neighbors on notice, right? Oh, right. Things. And like I said on the last episode, is that a lot of people, they lo- they're super excited that they're getting work done on the property. That makes them happy. They're actually living there. They they chose to live there. They like living there. And then when we start to renovate, everybody wants to be a part of that. And more than half of them, maybe 60%, will stay and pay a premium to be there. Because they want to be a part of a property that's doing well. And so that's an easy way. So, but you got to do that exterior stuff first. And then you can start doing the interior stuff second. 
Cool. Um, so Sean, what, what, um, what are your dreams? Where do you see yourself five years from now? Five years from now. Oh, I love this one. Five years from now, I've got some ambitious goals. So right now I'm at 390 units, five years, I'd like to be at 5,000 units and I would like to be syndicating and operating my own deals. Um, obviously still have to partner with people cause that's how, you know, the game is played, but I would love to be operating and leading my, my own deals by at that point. And I see having a team of people that right now I have one partner, but I, I would see that we'd have a team of people in five years and I'd be living, you know, as Corey says, the sunsets and palm trees life, except probably to get to 5,000 units, you wouldn't be, but you could be. So <laughs> no, I think that's but, perfect. It's a great, yeah. that's a great goal. And what books are you reading right now? Or what, what's a book that you've been reading that, um, that has inspired you? So the book I'm reading right now is um, Am I Being Too Subtle by Sam Zell. And for those who don't know Sam Zell, he's kind of the uh, father or godfather of REITs, um, big real estate investor. And it's anyone who hasn't read it, I would highly nice. recommend um, that book. He just has a lot of insight. He's gone through a lot of different market cycles, real estate market cycles, and has a lot of amazing insight. Um, another great book that I would highly recommend is the um, Extreme Ownership book and also the Dichotomy of Leadership by Jocko. He's a former Navy SEAL. It's just a great book um, for anyone who, even if you're not a business owner, it's just, it, it teaches you that everything comes back on you. And when you take ownership of everything, great things will come. Um, yeah. That's what I try to do. Oh, that's lovely, man. I love it. That's good. Those are good books. It's funny. I'm actually reading um, The Cycle of the Gift. Oh, and cool. so uh, this is a different, it's a way different book that I've ever read. But I, I'm getting, I'm 47 years old right now. And um, what matters to me now is like when I talk about the generational wealth is how do I pass it on? <laughs> and um, so the cycle of the gift talks about how wealthy families give and um, not just the schematics, but it's more important to understand who they're giving, like transferring of wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be a good giver, but you also have to condition the receivers to understand why and how to make them good receivers of the gift, right? Meaning you can ruin people with money. You really can. Yep. Or people will be like, oh, he's buying me off. Or, oh, my dad doesn't care because he's just doing this to, to not pay any taxes, right? I mean, it's really it gets really weird. It gets into all the subtleties. And what's mainly solved about it is through communication. And yeah. because people don't talk about money, you know, so these real wealthy people are just cutting checks and send them out. They don't put anything behind it or why or what they're doing. And so, because they're afraid that someone's going to judge them. And just on the other side, they're like, well, how come they're not talking to me? Right. And then the other people that gave the money is like, how come they didn't say thank you? And the people are like, am I supposed to send a thank you card? Or, you know, how do, how do we handle the money? What do we do? What do we say? Anyways, it's fascinating to me. That's really cool. That's so, that's great stuff to know too, because you, you wouldn't even know to to think of that when you're in that situation. You'd think that you could just stroke a check and everything would be fine, but yeah, it's clearly not. You you everyone knows people that are you know trust fund, you know kids that aren't so great, and that's that's where it, it clearly stems from. So that's yeah. interesting. It was really it's just been a really interesting read, and um, but it's making me aware. Right. And I, yeah. so I always like sometimes some there's things that, you know, and there's things that you don't know. And there's things that you don't know that you don't even know. <laughs> right. right. And I'm in that realm right now with this. And uh, so it's really cool to be enlightened and to get, you know, a little knowledge of, wow, OK. And by no means am I that there yet. But but I just like you, you know, Sean, you've got some pretty lofty five year goals. But I, I do, too. I think what it's taken me 15 years to do and achieve and the next five years, I'll quadruple it, mm -hmm. right? Whatever. I mean, I don't think we have got two. We have like two thousand. I've been. Hey, Sean, it's taken me fifteen years to get to two thousand units. I'm a little over two thousand, but still. Um, but I think. I mean, I think we'll quadruple it. Quadru two, four, six, eight, almost eight thousand units in the next five. 
right? And because it just takes, it's it's the law of attraction and, and a belief, right? And why yep. not? Yeah. And with well, that comes a lot of wealth. Yeah, it does. Right? And, and freedom. And freedom and just everything, right? So it's, I don't even care about the money anymore. But I like to keep score, like playing the game. Yep. And I want to build a team. I want to build a company. And so, you know, like we've said it, said it on a couple of podcasts that we're moving out of the out, out of the home office finally, and didn't don't have to do it. I could I could choose to play small and do great, but like we want to play a little bit bigger, and then just become and elevate myself to the CEO, where I'm not the man anymore. I don't want to be the man. I just want to have the team be the the the, the men and women, and I'm just the guy that leads the ship. But I'm not nothing special. I want to hire way more cool people than me. Yeah. And the cool thing that's going to happen about that is you're going to create this huge empire and it's obviously going to create wealth, but you're going to make other people wealthy that are working on within your team. And that's probably going to be one of the coolest feelings is that you get to see you built these people, you help foster this, their success and they're wealthy because of your company. And that's got to be an amazing feeling. I think that's what, to me, I think that's what it is. I think that's that, that to me is the journey. Well, listen, brother, I want to thank you for coming in and sharing uh, this little Warner Robbins story of how you you got real focused and really you just took everything that I taught, which was just go out and meet people, get out, um, develop those relationships. You did a great job in doing that. You fostered them, um, and it's going to lead to you even more and more deals. So I couldn't be more proud of you, and just really my hats off because I know how hard this business is to to break into. And my friend, you're there. Thanks, you, Corey. You've knocked on it. You've opened the door and walked right through, brother. So uh, I see you hitting your goal in that five-year mark. I'm really excited to watch what you do. Um, for anybody that wants to know how to get a hold of Sean Winslow, where do they go, brother? Because I know you've also had your own podcast as well. That's right. And that's thanks to Corey. So if anyone wants to get on this business, I would highly recommend his mastermind. And that's, you know, I'm not just plugging him. I truly mean it. I wouldn't have a podcast without Corey's advice. And it's, it's, I'm already seeing the, the benefits. You get everything from, you know, just a following to networking. It's amazing. So, yeah, it's the multifamily money podcast on anywhere you can listen to podcasts or watch podcasts on YouTube as well. Um, and then you can find me on Instagram. Handle is at Shauna Wins. That's where I'm most active. And then our website's greenbriarcg.com. And Corey, if you don't mind, I can. I can uh, leave a little tech if they text a message. Yeah. Um, I, I put together kind of my outline of how I found a deal and it goes into a lot of detail. And so oh, if anyone's, if anyone's interested in that, just text deals, D E A L S to four, one, five, five, two, eight, seven, four, zero, three. Again, that's four, one, five, five, two, eight, seven, four, zero, three. And that's text deals. Perfect. Wonderful brother. Listen, again, thank you so much, guys, Arshad, for coming in and really just giving um, the realness of what it takes to get a deal. Um, very candid, very open, just like, here's what I did. I, you know, I didn't, I just, I went out and did the work. And uh, and you had to underwrite quite a few deals to find that deal, right? Oh, yeah. And we're, we're still underwriting a lot of deals now to find the next one, so <laughs> it's, it's never ending. <laughs> guys, Sean is a testament to when you're persistent and you work with purpose, you will find what you need. It always shows up, it always appears, right? But the first place that has to appear, it's in between those little two ears, and that's your brain, your mind. Your mind is such a magnet, it attracts all those things that you feed it. And I'm telling you, you've got to be feeding your mind with powerful, positive thoughts. When you do that, I'm telling you, nothing is impossible. If you believe it, you can achieve it, and your paradise is possible.